Hello class, this is the last time, the, the last place that we left off. Last time we were in class together, we were discussing what causes sexual differentiation. Specifically, what are those proximate mechanisms, i.e. physiology, molecular, cellular processes that actually leads to sexual differentiation. And so we came up together as a group that it probably has something to do with sex chromosomes, right? We kind of all loosely know, we've heard before, that XX in mammals is what gives rise to the female phenotype. XY is what gives rise to the male phenotype, right? Those individuals that either make large gametes eggs or small gametes sperm, respectively. Uh, we also discussed that it probably has something to do with uh, hormones, right? So testosterone, estrogens, we've heard this before. That has something to do with, with sex and sex differences. So it probably has something to do with those. So let's first start with chromosomes, right? So I'm gonna be talking about, when I talk about the uh, chromosomes, I'll be talking about the genetic sex, right? Um, or chromosomal sex. And I'll be discussing for the purposes of this lesson uh, in the context of mammals, which is the X and Y chromosomes, or the two different sex chromosomes. If we were talking about this in avian species, I'd be talking about the ZW, the ZW chromosomes. Um, and as you remember from the last question on the exam, it's different in birds, right? It's the females that have the two different sex chromosomes. Um, and so this is the case in mammals, but, but the mechanisms we talk about are similar across taxa for those animals that use genetic sex determination. If you remember before, uh, one of the previous lectures, I mentioned that there are some animals that their sex is determined via environmental factors. Environmental factors. Um, for example, there are quite a few reptiles um, where their sex determination is just a function of temperature. A little bit cooler, a little bit warmer, determines whether or not embryos develop into males or females, All right? So obviously these mechanisms would not ap apply to those individuals because they don't even have sex chromosomes. So genetic sex in mammals. And so this will be probably a, a review for, for many of you, but let's go through it to make sure that we're all on the same page. All right, so an individual has a genotype. All right, we've got a lot of chromosomes. You got 23, 23 pair of chromosomes. Uh, and we've got a sex, a pair of sex chromosomes. And there's two different types. There's an X and there's a Y, All right? Since you have a pair, the only possible combinations you can have are XX or XY, okay? YY is not a viable genotype. That genotype would not uh, uh, fully develop into a, vi a viable organism, All right? So XX and XY are the possible combinations. So if you're an XX individual, um, your, your uh, gametic cells are gonna, they're gonna start to, your cells are gonna start to go through meiosis to produce gametes. So that means your genome essentially splits into two. Those pairs of chromosomes get split apart from one another. So in one gamete, you'll have half of your genome, including one of the sex chromosomes. So in an XX individual, this is, uh, this means that it would have an X chromosome. And then the complement, the other half of that genotype would have the other X chromosome. The same process happens in those individuals that have an XY genotype. So through meiosis, one cell's uh, genome gets split into two including the two sex chromosomes. One half of that genome will have the X sex chromosome. The other half will have, the other half of that genome will have the Y chromosome along with it. And those produce into either eggs or sperm. So all of a, of a female's eggs, um, in, in most cases, are XX. And most of a, of a male's sperm, in most cases, are X, Y. 
And of course, the last step in sexual reproduction is the fusion of those gametes. So they come together, bringing two halves of a full, two halves of a full genome together. And you can go through the different possible combinations of egg and sperm, and what we end up with is is a half and half. Uh, ratio between XX individuals and XY individuals. And as uh, many of you probably heard before, right, it's the male that, it's the male sperm that determines the sex of the offspring because they are the individuals that have the two different sex chromosomes. It's the exact opposite in birds. They are the females are the ones that determine sex because half of their eggs are Z and the other half are W. So now that we've run through this and sort of the significance of the two different sex chromosomes and what that means during this process of gamete formation and gamete fusion, let's talk about what's special about the, the X chromosomes. And so sort of the, the, in respect to sexual differentiation and sexual, um, um, what I have here called sexual determination, right? Which is largely seen as the, the first, um, sort of the first step in, in sexual reproduction, right? That sexual determination comes first, which involves the chromosomes. They determine the sex. And then sexual differentiation is what happens downstream of the sex chromosomes, the actual physiological hormonal stuff that goes on that differentiates. And so the uh, common view of sort of the genetic sex, the sex of the chromosomes or determined by the chromosomes is sexual determination. So on the Y chromosome is a gene, the SRY gene. It's the sex determining region of the Y chromosome. Now, I won't get into it here, but later, um, but the SRY, the SRY gene um, doesn't necessarily have to be on the Y chromosome and sometimes is not on the Y chromosome. Um, but in the majority of the cases, it is. And so this SRY gene gets, gets transcribed and translated like all genes to produce a protein. This protein is called the testes determining factor, TDF. So before you get lost in what all these words mean, um, let's go through it step by step. The testes determining factor. So what kind of protein is it? So it's a transcription factor. That's a, a protein that has a very specific function. Um, it controls the rate of transcription of genetic information from DNA to messenger RNA, which is the first step of getting from DNA to a protein. So let's talk about this. What is, what is a transcription factor? Well, first, what is transcription? Right? It's that first step, like I said, from DNA to a protein. And right here, just to illustrate, we're talking about this gene that codes for a, res, uh, a receptor for estrogen, and it, and it eventually codes and gets translated into an estrogen receptor that goes to some target tissue, it's on the surface of a cell, and it binds the, uh, the, an estrogen hormone. And it's pretty easy to remember trans uh, transcription as the first because there's only two general processes um, when you from from getting from DNA to protein. So DNA gets transcribed into RNA via something called um, uh, uh, RNA polymerase, and we call this messenger RNA because it's sort of it's carrying a message from DNA to little cell machineries, and the message is, hey, make this protein, right? make, make this estrogen receptor. Uh, and translation being that last step, right? So 
we're concerned with transcription here because um, our SRY gene codes for a protein that is a transcription factor. So it has something to do with this process. So what does a transcription factor do? So transcription factors, TF, they can promote or repress transcription. So they can either facilitate, get started, that process that gets you from DNA to RNA, which is halfway on your way to the protein, or it can actually repress it. It can keep it from happening. So let's take a look at my, my, my horrible stop, uh, stop motion animation here of our wonderful TF parallelogram. And what it does is it's floating around in the nucleus and there are specific places on the DNA in which this protein binds. So it holds on tight to the DNA in specific areas. Those areas are called promoter regions of a gene and they're upstream from a gene. They're kind of the beginning, the very beginning of a gene. So transcription factors bind to it. This allows for another protein called RNA polymerase to come in, bind to the transcription factor, and thereby bind to the DNA. So RNA polymerase can't bind to DNA on its own. It needs the transcription factor to, to kind of hold its hand to get started. So now our polymerase is attached to the DNA and it can move along step by step and as it does this, it reads the DNA, it brings in other nucleic acids um, from, from, from within the cellular space, inside the nuclear space, and it builds, it transcribes an RNA version of the DNA code. Chemically very similar, slightly different, but RNA is what you need to eventually get to the protein. You can't get protein directly from the DNA. So you need this, this middle person, RNA. And this is what RNA polymerase does. It's the little cellular factory that reads the DNA and makes the RNA. Without the transcription factor, polymerase wouldn't be able to do this. It kind of tells the polymerase, hey, this is where you start. This is where the gene starts. So this would be an example of how a transcription factor promotes the transcription of a gene. But as I said before, um, it can also repress it. Right? it the, the, if it's a different type, say we have a different transcription factor now, it binds to the promoter region of the same gene, but this transcription factor actually does the opposite. It, it prevents RNA polymerase from binding to it and binding to the DNA, right? So it rebuffs it. It says, get out of here. There's, there's no place for you um, to do your business here. Um, so in that way, um, it's refused access to the DNA. It can't make the RNA. Ergo, the protein is never made, right? And this transcription factor might be competing with another transcription factor that is that um, is promoting polymerase. And this is the repressive version of it. So they do two different things. And in this way, transcription factors are the on-off switch of genes. Right? So genes can be turned on and off. And this is, this is uh, a primary way in which a gene can be turned on and off because it controls whether or not it gets transcribed. So why were we talking about transcription factors again? Let's see. Ah, right. Because the SRY gene codes for a transcription factor. That transcription factor is called the testes determining factor. So testes determining probably has something to do with development of the testes. Indeed it does. So bear with me, take a look at this complicated, seemingly complicated looking map here. I need a place for myself. So let's take a look at our SRY 
Ah. Our SRY gene that codes for the TDF, the testes determining factor. So that determining factor has over 3,000 targets. That means that this transcription factor that comes out of the SRY gene can bind to 3,000 different places along the genome, okay? Other chromosomes, other genes. And it does primarily two things. It either acts as a repressor for genes that facilitate the development of ovaries. It turns them off. It refuses polymerase from binding to them. On the other hand, at other places, it acts as a promoter. It brings in RNA polymerase, and it says to, to, to genes that are involved in developing the testes, testicular genes. Another major thing, thing that it does is that it promotes uh, the transcription of a gene called SOX9. And in turn, SOX9 codes for another transcription factor that targets other genes and does the similar, the similar thing. SOX9 generally represses the, the turning on the, the uh, um, transcription of genes that are involved in ovarian development, turns them off. And it turns on and facilitates the transcription of genes involved in testicular genes, in, in testicular development. So the SRY gene codes for a protein that's, that starts sort of a cascade of events that leads to either promotion of development of the testes and, and, and turning off of the development of the ovarian genes. And so why do the ovarian genes need to be turned off? Right. Well, that's because um, the, the, um, in the development of primary sexual characteristics, so the, 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 in, uh, among the internal sex anatomy, you have arguably the most important part of it, the gonads. And so in early development in an embryo, uh, previous in humans, this is previous to uh, about the first five weeks, they have gonads. And these are what are known as bipotential tissue. They're tissues that could go two different ways. They could develop into testes or they could develop into ovaries. What determines whether or not they develop into that? Well, it's largely whether or not you have the SRY gene, which codes for the testes determining factor, which leads to that huge cascade of repressing ovarian genes, turning on testicular genes. So in the presence of SRY, you get a flood of genes that promote turning the gonads into testes and preventing them from turning into ovaries. In the absence of the SRY gene, which is usually what you get when you're an XX individual, you don't have that transcription factor. You don't have all of these testes promoting genes being turned on. You don't have the repression of ovarian genes. So by default, they naturally develop into ovaries. If you don't have the SRY gene, this is what happens to these, this bipotential tissue. The default is ovaries. So by default, embryos develop, develop uh, into a female genotype. All right, so you can see, really does, does XY is that what causes a male phenotype? Really, it's the SRY gene, right? Not necessarily the Y chromosome. If you could go in to an XY genotype and pluck out that SRY gene, it would naturally develop, the gonads would naturally develop into ovaries, right? And we'll see that this actually naturally happens from time to time. So this in turn starts another cascade of events. This SRY gene 
basically determines testes or ovaries. The development of testes starts another cascade, a hormonal cascade. So let's let's touch on that a little bit here. Okay, we're going to dive really deep into the, this hormonal cascade and take it all the way downstream uh, to the brain and behavior. Right, but first, we're just going to touch on it here in early development. Um, so we're still talking about the, the, the primary sexual characteristics and specifically the internal genitalia. So we've covered the gonads, testes or ovaries. Um, but there's other parts of the internal in, uh, internal genitalia. Um, and they're different than the gonads during early development, whereas the gonads can go either way, they're bipotential. Um, there are two different types of tissues that are present in the embryo. They're unipotential tissues. That means that they can only develop into one type of tissue. There's something called the Wolfian ducts, illustrated here in red. Uh, these would eventually give rise to the seminal vesicles, vas deferens, the epididymis, and the malarian ducts. These would eventually give rise to the female internal genitalia, the oviducts, the uterus, and the cervix. So, typically during early development in mammals, what determines which one develops? Right, because most phenotypes, I'll say again, most, um, but not all, have either or. So it's largely hormonally driven. So the Wolfian ducts are supported by testosterone secreted from the fetal testes. And the testes also secrete molarian inhibiting hormone, MIH. So, and this is kind of similar to what we saw with the SRY gene, because the SRY gene was doing two things, promoting genes for, for the development of the testes and repressing genes that promoted development of the ovaries. And so once those testes start to develop, they start pumping out two different hormones. The testes start pumping out testosterone, which develops the Wolfian ducts which will turn into those internal genitalia of the male phenotype. They also secrete MIH, the malaria inhibiting hormone, which, which prevents the, the uh, malarian ducts from developing into the female genitalia. And like the, um, the SRY gene, in the absence of testes, you have an absence, uh, largely an absence of this flood of testosterone, and you don't have MIH. So what happens naturally, again by default, by default, the Wolfian ducts atrophy and disappear. They're there, but if they don't see testosterone, they, they, they atrophy, they experience cell death, and they basically disappear in a developing embryo. In the absence of MIH, just by default, the malarian ducts will develop naturally into those parts of the, of the typical female internal genitalia, the uterus, the cervix, the fallopian tubes. Likewise, it's this hormonal cascade that is responsible for the external genitalia. And like the internal genitalia, external genitalia start as, as a, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, um, not like the internal genitalia, but like the gonads, the external genitalia start as a bipotential tissue, right? Like the gonads, they could go either or depending on what they're exposed to during early development. And what drives this? Well, by default, this bipotential tissue, as we see up here at about seven weeks, the, the genital tubercle will eventually develop into the clitoris, 
the genital swellings will eventually develop into the labia. But in the presence of these hormones that, again, the fetal testes start to produce, it goes in a different direction. The genital tubercle will develop into the penis. The, the genital swellings will develop into the scrotum. And that's because of actions of T, which is shorthand for testosterone. You'll see that a lot in further lectures. And something called dihydrogen testosterone, um, which is a uh, testosterone is a precursor of dihydrogen testosterone. So testosterone gets converted into dihydrogen testosterone. And think of it as a super potent testosterone. It's about 10 times more potent in terms of its binding of affinity to receptors throughout tissues. Um, so really, it's hormones from the testes that are responsible for the external genitalia differentiation as well. So you can see how things are connected here. XY chromosome, the Y chromosome, typically has the SRY gene. Uh, the SRY gene codes for a protein that is literally involved with thousands of genes turning on and off that have to do with either um, promoting or repressing the development of the gonads into testes or ovaries. The testes produce hormones. Those hormones are involved in the development or the repression of the two different internal um, uh, tissues that are involved in the internal genitalia, the Wolfian ducts and the Mullerian ducts. And they also influence this bipotential tissue on the outside of the body that eventually develop into the external genitalia. Right, so already this is quite a complicated cascade from the genetic sex to um, the uh, internal and external genitalia sex. So next class, we're going to get into more details. What, it, what I've outlined here in this lecture, we can think of it as a general outline of sexual um, sex determination um, and specifically, um, we'll call it um, the, um, the, the, the sex uh, the anatomical phenotype and the the uh, um, in part the physiological phenotype as well, right? Because as I've discussed, I've kind of at least hinted at before that sexual differentiation um, and and sex phenotypes are are somewhat complicated, and there's not one sex phenotype, right? What's the sex phenotype? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean genetic sex? Do you mean morphological sex? Do you mean hormonal sex? Uh, behavioral? Because there's a lot of different phenotypes that are associated with the process of sexual differentiation. So next class, uh, I'll give a primer on hormones. We'll talk in more depth about um, genetic sex, chromosomal sex. And as we'll see, we're going to build on this scaffolding that we have here of sex chromosomes, SRY, and these downstream hormonal effects of the de the develop the development of the of the internal and external primary sex characteristics. We'll build on that, and we're going to first start building on genetic sex and chromosomal sex because simple XY, SRY gene, yes, no. It's not that simple. So uh, come to class with any questions you have on this video. Thanks.